I probably spend more time, honestly, fearing it being gone than I do cherishing cherishing it, honestly. Um, as I just turned 30 now, so I'm getting older, you know, kind of on the downside, I'm trying to appreciate the moments more and things like that. But even now, I just can't get it out of my head. Like, man, I need another contract. I need to do this. Like, it's never out of my head. I'm always reaching for the next thing. This is Sad Boy Radio. Ask me, can I love the same? What's going on, everybody? Welcome back to Sad Boy Radio. It's a little different today. We're not we're not in private stock right now. We're over here at the Four Seasons. Wait, can I drop that? I don't know, for sure. Yeah, yeah. I, I just want to make sure. Yeah, you saw But it. shit, man, we got a very special guest today. He's a Washington wizard, recently acquired. Uh, one of the hardest working individuals. Man, your story is definitely very unique, and it just shows how much work you put into your craft. How much you put into being the best at what you, you know, what you do. Absolutely. Go Absolutely. ahead and introduce yourself. Hey, Rashawn Holmes, for those who don't know, uh, from right here, Chicago, Illinois. Actually born in Maywood. So, uh, you know, that's for my Chicagoans. You know, when I'm out of state, let everybody know from Chicago. When I'm back in state, let them know it's Maywood. So, you know how that go. You know, I've uh, been in the league, NBA, for nine years now. Uh, recently traded to the Wizards, as he said, and... Man, just looking forward to continuing the journey. What's your plan to celebrate the 10-year? I'm going to just get around my family. I feel like, you know, uh, probably be out here, honestly, and just uh, get together with my parents, brothers, everybody, and just celebrate this journey we've been on together, man. It's, it's been a long 10 years, but probably the quickest 10 years because I just can't believe, you know, I'm at this point in my life, my career, where I'm the vet now on mm-hmm. these teams. I'm the veteran, the guy they looking for. To be a voice in the locker room, you know, it's, it's wild. So, but definitely something to be celebrated for sure. How do you feel like that transition happened for you? Did it just happen out of nowhere, and now everybody's looking at you for the answers? Oh man, for, for me, like I said, it's it's almost like I'm a rookie some days. You know, I'm saying like I'm still searching, still trying to figure out my own way. But at the same time, you know, just giving that knowledge to the guys that come after me of you know how hard this is or what I had to do to stay in the NBA. You know, just now I got to understand and just how valuable that is. So I think it's something I kind of just flowed into and, you know, something I kind of was really natural at. What would you say is the most important thing you've done to make sure that you maintain that place in the NBA? Everybody cold in the NBA. Like, everybody talented. Everybody was the man on their team before that. So for me, it's just mentally understanding I'm not going to let none of these guys out here on this court outwork me because that's my thing, like... I got to make sure I'm working the hardest, bringing the most energy, stuff like that. So that's my main thing, just having that chip on my shoulder, understanding that these dudes can't outwork me. They can't be more of a dog than me on that court. And every time I step on the floor, I take that mindset with me. It proves, bro. I'm I'm telling you, you know, the fact that you've made it this long, a lot of people, especially coming out of the second round, the odds are historically stacked against you in that situation. So when you're putting in that work and showing people like, hey, I belong here, That's what really matters. You want respect more than anything, you know what I'm saying? And I think that longevity, it comes with respect, especially from your peers, because they understand how hard it is to do it, how hard it is to get up there and outground everybody every day. So I think for me, that's just the respect that comes with it, you know, uh, something I always wanted from my peers and, you know, from everybody else. So who gave you the welcome to the league moment, bro? Man, I actually got a couple. The first one... That I got dunked on by KJ McDaniels. At the end of my rookie year, he caught a tip dunk on me when I was, and I jumped as high as I could for the rebound too, man. He caught me and banged on me. First time I ever been dunk, dunked on in my life. So for that, that was one. And then my first time matching up against Brian, like <laughs> I remember getting called out, ISO on him, man. He take a couple back pedals towards half court, go between the legs. I'm looking at him like, man, I seen him do this for years, man. Man, I'm out here guarding Brian. I'm oh man, there you go. And he at the rim dunking that joint like, huh? Real quick. And I don't think I played for the next twenty games after that. Oh like, my God. <laughs> so I learned quick, man. You starstruck, man. You gonna be on that bench. So I was. That was a quick learning experience for me, for sure. But man, I was for sure starstruck when I first saw him. You know how sometimes when you're playing a pickup game. And you're like, ah, whatever, he scored on me that one time. Like, like you know the dude's cold as fuck, yeah, yeah. and you know he's about to score, uh, but you do your best, and you're like, man, fuck it. Like, that, I did everything I could. That could be every possession in the league, for real. Like, you know, pickup games, 
you know, you come down, dude may get hot a couple times, but the league, man, if he get hot, they going at him every single time. He getting the ball every possession. So you're going to have to get a stop at some point. Otherwise, man, you're just going to be looking bad out there. Or you ain't going to play for 20 games like I did. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? How do you feel like that impacted your confidence, though? You know, it's LeBron. LeBron did that shit, but then you face the, rec- the repercussions of not playing 20 games. I think for me, that for anything, that made me, like, lit a fire. Like, I was super competitive after that point because it was, like, you a grown man now. Don't nobody care about, you know, who you looked up to or who you wanted to play with or play against when you was younger. Nobody cared about that. It's all a grown man in this league. Like, Brian saw me and he saw dinner. So when I went out, like, that's how I wanted to look at it. I right, bet next time I see Brian, he fooled. You know what I'm saying? Everybody fooled. Ain't no more starstruck, so... That kind of just switched my mindset, you know, very, very fast in order to get to that that point where I'm competing like I was in junior college or in high school. Like, no matter who in front of me, I'm going at them. You mentioned playing with LeBron. You mentioned, you know, having to take it back to those junior college days. Lighting that fire under you. And to get to that point, right, you had to go through Moraine Valley. You had to go to Bowling Green. Man. <laughs> Talk about those experiences and what that was like real quick. I always tell everybody... Like, Moraine Valley is kind of where that chip on the shoulder came from. Like, you know, my brothers growing up, you know, I always wanted to be tough, you know, against them. So early on, it was my brothers. You know, as a kid, you know, you want to go grow up and beat them and go at them. And that was the chip that was on my shoulder. When I got to Moraine, that was the first time I seen other grown men that didn't care about me, didn't care about what I had going on. And, man, they would do anything to put food on their plate for their kids. So Moraine Valley kind of made me a man on that basketball court in a sense, man. I got to respond. I remember, like, my first couple months training in Moraine Valley and the guys that was on my team, we had some dudes that was 24, 25. You know, this their last chance, you know, to put food, you know, playing basketball, to get overseas, do something. And, man, they looking at me like, man, this dude's soft. This the guy y'all brought in to be the big. This dude's soft. He ain't got it. And I had to respond to that. And I think Moraine Valley taught me more than anything how to just be a dog about yours. Like, people going to talk, you know, the Chicago style, how we hoop out here. You know, it's going, it's treacherous. And so I think just being in Moraine Valley, being in that, that head space, it made me a man on that court. Like, can't nobody stop me. I right, bet. I don't care what this dude talking about or I'm going through his chest. Like, we going to get this done. And I was real skinny at the time. I hadn't even lifted weights yet. But the mindset is I'm going to get through it. And so once I got to Bowling Green and I was able to take that mindset to BG, now you got D1 weight rooms, D1 people that, you know, help you with your shot, with your skill, and now the talent's coming in. But that attitude, I had to develop at JUCO because if anybody played at JUCO, they know it's different to any other level when it comes to mindset. And so taking that Moraine Valley mindset and then you mix that with the BG, you know, weight room and, you know, dietitians, they got people to put you on food to make sure you right. And you just got a monster at that point. You got some D1 offers after you had committed, correct? Yeah. Yeah. Why didn't you take those and you went straight to JUCO instead? BG coming out in the beginning, like, when I was growing still. Like, I wasn't, you know, they they didn't know what they was getting. They was there in August when I was still the skinny kid coming out of Lockport that didn't know what to expect, and they was there then offering me. They offered me at the beginning of the season. Like, we see it now. And I think after, you know, once I started playing and then the school started coming in, like, okay, now now we believe in you. Now we believe in you. I just wanted to rock with the with the school that believed in me from the jump. Mm-hmm. Shit, it got you where you needed to be, bro. Oh, for sure. For sure. I really admire the fact that you worked so hard because sometimes it doesn't even take being the best. Mm. I used to always tell people, like, I wasn't the smartest growing up. My brother's a lot smarter than me, mm. but I was a harder worker than he yeah. was. And that's the reason why I've been able to pursue different things. That's the reason I went on to finish college in three years. Yeah, that's impressive. It's stuff like that that I had the ambition and I knew like, hey, this is what I'm going to do, so I'm going to go do it. And that's not a knock to my siblings or anything, but that's just how I viewed myself because everybody's got those qualities, everybody's got those aspects. It's what you do with those that's going to push you to that next level. Man, exactly, man. Like Kevin Durant, he got one of my, my favorite quotes ever from that. Like, hard work beats talent if talent doesn't work hard. Like, you come out, you can be the most talented. It's 
dudes that's way more talented than me, talented than me that was out the league in two, three years because they just didn't work as hard as I did. Like, I would, like, do anything to stay in the NBA, do anything to get on that floor. And, like, like you said, man, that, that, that mindset of just being able to outwork people would take you further than talent ever could. It's kind of contradictory to ask you this now, but is there that fear that you wouldn't make that 10th year? Like, Tony Snell, right? He just mm-hmm. didn't make that 10th year, and there was a big, like, media push on that. Like, he needs to get that 10th year type shit. I've seen that, man. I, I hope they work that out for real because that's... To be right there at the the ten year mark, you know what I'm saying. I, I hope they can do something for him for real. But I mean, for me, it was that fear is always there every year. Like that's one of the things that motivate me. Like I probably played every NBA game I played scared. Like man, these dudes trying to take food off me. I got to respond because you know, like when you fearful, you feel like you kind of backed into a corner in that mindset. That's when you come out swinging even wilder. So I think for me, I, I played with that fear. I internalized that fear and like. I'm going to make sure this doesn't become a reality. How do you feel like that fear got instilled in you, though? Was it growing up? One thing I understood before I even got drafted was how hard it was to get there, and after that, how hard it is to stay there. And so even once I got drafted, I was always just terrified that maybe they're going to realize that I'm not supposed to be here, or maybe I'm not supposed to be on the floor. You have a bad string of games, and... You know, your coach going off on you, you know what I'm saying? That fear for me, it, w- it was just always there. Like, from the moment, you know, I went to the tournament at the college, the Portsmouth Invitational, and my first time meeting with NBA teams. Like, I get a chance to talk to them, see what they want, see what they're looking for. That fear started then. Like, oh, man, I got to go and prove to these dudes that I actually can do this. Like, can I do this? I don't know. I'm going to be playing with Brian. I'm going to be playing with Steph. I'm going to be playing with these. Can I do this? So that that fear was something that always pushed me to even work even harder because I don't want to be in that position, you know what I'm saying? And it's that fear of it, it can be taken away to, at any time. Oh, man, like any time. I'm telling you, dudes that was drafted higher than me, first round, you know what I'm saying, they out the league two, three years. So, you know, I got that understanding, especially as a second-round pick, that, man, you got to work hard to stay here because they will boot you at any second. It's a dog-eat-dog world. I related back to the fact that when we were going crazy with our clips, you know, we had a couple million views on a couple of them. And every day that I woke up, I had this fear of it was going to leave. That one of these clips is going to fail and I'm just never going to get back to that point. And I think that with success, when you reach it so early on, it's like you don't cherish it enough. And you cherish it once it's gone. Oh, man, that's true. That's definitely true. And that's why I asked that about the fear aspect because... You're so scared that you're going to lose it that you don't appreciate what you have while you have it. That's something I'm learning now as I get older and talk to my brothers and parents and they just always want to make sure, you know, like, hey, man, you didn't accomplish a lot. You Make sure you enjoy this moment. Make sure, hey, man, it's not this ninth year for you. Make sure you enjoy this. You know, that's they kind of keep me grounded in that. And I thank God for my family and that for sure. Do you think you have an inability to appreciate the things that you've accomplished? It's not so much. I don't think I have an inability because definitely to be in this moment and to, like I say, it's almost feels like I'm a rookie because I'm still living the dream. Like I'm, I'm in the moment and I appreciate every second I'm in the NBA but like you said, it's the other side of it where it's, I don't want this to be taken away. So I'm, I probably spend more time honestly fearing it being gone than I do cherish, cherishing it, honestly. Um, as I just turned 30 now, so I'm getting older, you know, on the kind of on the downside, I'm trying to appreciate the moments more and things like that. But even now, I just can't get it out of my head. Like, man, I need another contract. I need to do this. Like, it, it's never out of my head. I'm always reaching for the next thing, so... I think, man, that's a good question. That's, that's something I had to think about, you know, uh, make sure I'm cherishing more than fearing. Do you know who Femdot is? Uh, it sounds familiar. Who, who is that? He's who is a it? Chicago rapper. Uh-huh. Uh, he made a song called Bobby Portis, actually. So that that was on, like, Jimmy Butler's story and shit. Hmm. But there's a song where he's talking about, you know, being perfect, and uh, I can't even remember the lyrics. But he's talking about the fact that, you know, we chase this idea of perfection for so long, but... Perfect isn't going to go with us to the grave. Man, that's deep. That's deep. And there's a line where he says, you know, uh, I've never seen a trailer on a hearse. Talking about all the money that you possibly have, it's not going to go with you. Mm -hmm. And when you're chasing that for so long, it's just that, you know, that idea of being perfect isn't real. Yeah. And for me, uh, 
growing up, I've learned that I have this inability to understand and to appreciate my accomplishments. Mm -hmm. So, and that comes from, you know, just being told like, oh, you didn't, you could do better. Yeah, yeah. You could do better. You could do better. Yeah. And it subconsciously gets ingrained in you. For you being a second round pick, I want to take it back to draft night for you. You didn't even get to see that on TV. Yeah, man. That's funny, man. That's funny. Anytime I think about draft night, like, so they, I don't know if, for the, so for the story, the story is that um we was watching it in the hotel room and I was picked number 37. And so they go to pick 36 they go on commercial break, and then the next pick is pick 38. So we just thinking, like, okay, well, they must have missed somebody. Man, I wonder what, what's the pick they skipped. All of a sudden, my brother get a call, like, hey, hey, they just picked your brother number 37. Number 37, he going to Philly. So we like, wait, what? We didn't see that. We didn't see nothing. And they finally flash back on TV, like, during the commercial break, this is who was picked 37th, and we finally see my name come across and everything. Man, we jumped up, ran all down the hall, ran all down the halls, banging on people's doors, letting them know, hey, man, I just got drafted. We out here. We out here. Going crazy. I had, like, man, one of the best days of my life, for sure. What did they tell you when you were banging on their doors? Like People was just walking out, like, man, what's going on? What's... Man, oh, man, go on, go on. Like, man, people were cussing us out, some of everything. Some people came out, jumped in the hallways with us. I think one couple recognized me for real and came out and just started partying with us. It was it was dope. It was, it was a good experience. But, man, we definitely woke some people up. Some people weren't happy. I definitely would have popped out and been like, hey, where's the shots, bro? Yeah, hey, nah. Where's the bottles? Nah, we for sure had people coming to party with us, for sure, though. Like, because I was in Bowling Green still, and so... You know, people I went to college with, teachers, some everybody came and got lit with us. It was it was a dope night for real. Going to the NBA, how did you approach that new level, knowing that hey, th this is something I got to take on? And again, going back to the historically second round picks have the odds stacked against them. My first year, man, listen, I, I was just trying to survive. <laughs> like, I mean, going into it, my mindset was, you know, I'm going. Just get this done. Like I said, I'm going to be a dog about it and do whatever I got to do. But physically, man, once I got into that season, 82 games, I had never played more than 30 games a year. You playing four or five games a week. Man, I was just trying to survive at a certain point. Like, we got another game. Man, I, do I got to play tonight? Okay, I'm not playing. Okay, cool. Let me just get stretched. Let me just go ahead and get a massage or something. Like, I just remember, like, my body feeling crazy that first year. And so going into my second year, I'm like, man, I got to figure something out because I can't go through like I did this first year because then I probably won't be in the league because I was barely scraping. I played like probably like 10 minutes my first year and just had a, I mean, it was tough. Had a couple good games, but it was just like one of the hardest years playing basketball in my life for real. So from that, I went to my second year and I just think things got easier. Like people talk about it like, you get adjusted to stuff, and it just got easier. And once my mindset and my physical kind of met, I was able to go out there and dominate. And like, especially like the last twenty some games of my second year, I feel like I averaged like like nineteen and ten or something like that. And so that kind of got my name going, especially in Philly. That was 2015, the second year. 2016, 2016. It was like a stretch of like the last 10, 15 games where. You know, I was going crazy, and I felt like I had it figured out at that point. It's crazy to hear that because you always, you know, you hear sports analysis talk about it all the time. They're going to make that second-year jump. They're going to make that second-year jump. But when you hear it from an actual athlete, now you understand, like, hey, this, this shit is real. This shit is crazy. It's for so real. Like, I'm telling you, that first year, like, for me even, like, you know what I'm saying? When I see rookies come in now, like, the dude, or Paolo Bancaro from Orlando came in, Grown man, ready to lead a team, man. Like, those dudes is, like, a different type of special to me. Because I just think about, like I said, my first year, man, I'm trying to survive. But that second year, after you kind of get in shape, you get a little bit more of your grown man weight. You get a summer working out with the team, you know, so you kind of understand how your body works a little bit better. And, man, that's the difference between the first year and second year for not just me, but most people, like you said, it'd be astronomical. What do you feel like's the biggest difference you see between yourself, your rookie year to now? Confidence. Like, and I think most people will tell you that. Like, as you play more, you build confidence. And as a second round pick, you don't really have too much confidence going in because you don't know if you're gonna play. You don't your contract not guaranteed. So 
you was out there fighting for your life. And then as you kind of understand what the coaches need from you, okay, now coaches are letting you play through more mistakes in your second year. You make a turnover now. They're not yanking you as fast. Now your confidence building. Okay, now, okay, I can take this shot maybe. Let's see how this shot work out. Let me make this move and see what I can do. I'm going to break this play off and go to the rim. Even if you miss it, coach got a little bit more confidence in you now, so you got more confidence. And you just get better like that. You you stop being so afraid to fail is my thing. Like, that's the biggest change from rookie year to now. Like, who cares if you miss a shot as opposed to rookie year? Every shot you miss is like, oh, my God, I'm coming out. I may not play the next 15 games. Like, I mean, you live and die by every shot you take as a rookie, especially as a second-round pick. So, yeah, I'd say that's the biggest difference for me. Like, I'm, I'm no longer afraid to fail on the court. Those 20 games fucked you up, huh? Oh, man. <laughs> I'll tell you, I, car- I carried that with me for the rest of my career, man. Like, I- I'll never forget it. One mistake, one blow by, I was in for two minutes, and boom, I'm out. So, got to be on point. Do you think that that fear to fail came from that chip being on your shoulder because you had that chip on your shoulder for so long. And when you're playing with that, when you're going through life with that, you're carrying that with you. And anytime there's that failure, like you said, oh my gosh, it's the end of the world. Growing up, it was more so like, I don't care. I don't, I don't care what happened. Like I'm a, whatever happens, I'm going to just go in and be a dog about it. Like growing up, you know, playing in Juco and things like that, like I wouldn't necessarily say it was fear of failure. It was just, I ain't got nothing to lose anyway. Like, mm. I'm going to just go out here and get it done. They don't expect nothing from me, so I'm going to go out here and be a dog about it. Once you get to the NBA, now there's expectations. You know, uh, people know your name. Everybody's talking to you, letting you know how hyped they are about the career you're supposed to have or you're going to have. And so I think the fear sets in a little bit there because, you know, you expect yourself to do something. Now you have to have a 10-year career, you know what I'm saying? You have to be somebody in the league and not somebody that's out the league in two years and, you know, back at home, you know, doing things. The fear kind of more so set in, like, once those expectations came because, you know, the coach is expecting you to be this, family members expecting you to have a long career, take care of them. You know, it's just so much that comes with it. And now it's like, okay, I can't fail. I got to make this work. But if I do fail, everybody going to be talking about it. Everybody going to know I failed, you know what I'm saying? As opposed to growing up, I'm just taking my L's in silence and moving on, you know. So I think that added a little bit more to the fifth factor. And that's a different type of pressure to be faced with. Mm. Leading your family, leading everybody that's around you. Yeah. Which is a great segue to what I actually wanted to talk about, right? Your childhood. Mm. You're the youngest of four. Mm Mm-hmm. Your dad was the leader of that. He's the, he's the one that has really instilled a lot of your mental toughness. He's instilled a lot of the things that you believe in, as well as the sacrifices and witnessing what he had to go through to get you to where you need to be. Absolutely. What do you feel like the toughest trial you witnessed him face that helped you shape your identity growing up? There was a time I was, I think I want to say I was about 12, 13 and we had to live in a in a hotel room for like I want to say like two months or something. I don't know if I'm wrong, brother, but it was like it was like two months or something like that. Forty days, yeah, forty days. And I remember knowing it was tough on him and knowing how tough it was on him. But I just remember how he handled the whole situation. Like smiles on the face. He still making us laugh. We having family nights in this small cramped hotel room. And no matter what was going on, he always made sure mentally we was good, physically we was good, emotionally we was good, no matter what he was feeling. And I didn't even find out till years later, so I was a grown man, how hard it really was on him. And so I think that situation for me, like, really shaped what I think about being a man. Like, when you're dealing with your family and you're dealing with, like, no matter what hardships coming, you make sure your family good, like... They thinking good. He always made sure my mom was good. Like, that's kind of the mark of being a man to me. That's that's one situation when I think of what being a man is that I always think of. What do you feel like it took for you to realize that, though? Because it took a couple years right there. Once I had my own son, like, that's when everything started coming. Like, I was like, oh, like, to be in a situation, not only did he, he had four of us. Like, it wasn't, I couldn't imagine being in a situation with one son. He had four of us. 
and had to make sure we were straight. One hotel room. One ho- I mean, small Not hotel like room. This. Not like this. One cramped <laughs> hotel room, man. One bathroom, like, and we just, everything was all good. We was together. My dad made sure we was good. Like, and then, I don't, like, I don't know how I could have held up, you know, physically, emotionally in that situation, you know what I'm saying? But, man, he did what he had to do, and... Man, he raised four men. Like he, 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 like is the mark of what a great man is to me. What do you feel like's the greatest lesson he's instilled in you? My dad, growing up, before we did anything, especially if we did something stupid, I mean, <laughs> we had a whole think piece about it. He asked you one thing. Now I want you to just think about that before you answer. Think. Okay, you sure that's the answer you want? Okay, bet. Now I'm asking you something else. No, 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 don't change the answer. Now I want you to think about it. No, think, think. And so that lesson of just thinking before I do anything then saved me so much trouble, bro. Like, I could tell you so many stories of where I wanted to be impulsive, especially, like, because I was a fighter growing up. I was, like, I was a real fighter growing up. I can tell you so many stories, bro, of things that didn't save me, like, just thinking, ah, oh, that may not be the best. And just that instilled in me to, like, since I was, like, three, four years old, even telling me to think like I was a grown man. So, mm-hmm. so yeah, that's, that's, that's been the most important thing from Pops. Uh, what's up with this fighting thing, though? Why do you feel like you have felt the need to always be getting into something? Man, I, I grew up with three older brothers. <laughs> I was skinny, and my my middle brother. We used to fight all the time. Like he the real fighter. Like I just ended up fighting all the time because he loved to fight. So he was the real fighter. But I mean, that's just how it was in our house. Like we used to play wrestle, but we wasn't playing. Like. So it wasn't, like, random people you were fighting, like, kids at school and shit? I took it out the crib. Because, like I said, my older brother, like, my middle brother, Dre, I was always with him, like, just around the neighborhood. And we always ended up fighting somebody. But it started for me fighting these dudes. Like, my brothers, like, that's just how we was. We always fought about everything. We thought that's how boys handle stuff. So, like, and then, yeah, back in the neighborhood, any any problems, man, we fighting. Like, we ain't had no problems fighting and being cool after... <laughs> Do you feel like it was more so like you were trying to prove something to somebody or it was just a, I mean, this is what we do type shit? That's just how, how we were. Like, I mean, of course, I want to prove it to my big brother. But at the same time, like, if he not around, I still love fighting. You know what I'm saying? I still want to fight. Like, so it probably started off like that. But, like, I, I wanted to be a boxer and everything when I was growing up. Like, mm-hmm. I, I didn't just enjoy fighting. Like, still enjoy watching boxing. I mm-hmm. take boxing lessons, do boxing training and in the summer, like, fighting has just always been something I like to do. No, I thought you were about to say, I still like fighting. I mean, yeah, I, I like boxing. I like boxing. I hit the heavy bag. Nah, man, I ain't got time for all that other stuff. Growing up, being the youngest, that chip on your shoulder, it it, it moves with you. Oh, yeah. You Absolutely. Can, you continue to find yourself in spaces where you're trying to prove that you're the best again, right? That's mm-hmm. probably why you work so hard. Definitely. Because that chip on your shoulder, it continues to follow you everywhere you go. I don't think that'll ever go nowhere, like, honestly. Like, I step into a new field, into a new endeavor. I'm going to have that same chip. Like, I don't think that's ever going to go nowhere. Like, you said, I just want to be the best or at least get the best I can out myself. I'm at least going to do that. Growing up with those older brothers, do you feel like it instilled that mental toughness that you needed to be where you are today? Oh, for sure. I I credit them in every interview, my dad and my brothers, because... You can get through growing up with those dudes. You can withstand anything in this life. So, but nah, just for real, the time they put in me, they, the time they put in with me, like I remember them lining me up on the garage because I couldn't catch the ball. And man, I ain't dropped the ball in like 10 years, man, like 10, 15 years. So like, it's just things that we do. We grew up as men, like I feel like, and... You know, we weren't afraid to get physical. And I don't think there's nothing wrong with that. And, you know, that's just how I came up. And I owe them a great deal of how I deal with things in this life because it's, it's a lot of stuff that's just soft to me because of them. Like, because of what I went through with them, it's just soft. I can get through it. Something happened, oh, man, it's soft. We're going to get through it. Like, it's just makes life so much easier for me. Man, your family's been a real proponent to what you do. You need a you need an amazing team to be successful. Absolutely. Couldn't be where I met without them. I think that's the key thing. And a lot of people forget that, that when they do something that fucks up everything, they forget that there's a team behind them, right? 
with that team comes a lot of sacrifices. Not only the sacrifices that you've had to make, but the sacrifices they've had to make. What do you feel like's the most important sacrifice that they've had to make so far, right? Your brother over here, he was telling us earlier, right? He took on the management role. Yeah, man. Like he he takes all the punches I don't want to take, man. Like he fills in every gap that needs to be filled in. Like, I mean, it's nothing that that my brother won't do. Like he won't do for me. And I think that's kind of the theme of our entire family, honestly. Like Somebody has something, we all get behind it and push them. We want them to know they're supported. And, you know, they know my schedule is tough. I can't get to things. I may not remember appointments or little things I got to do. They fill in. They fill in. Like, my mom, dad, my brothers, like, they just, they do everything I need them to do. Like, anything that's needed, anything that's even wanted, like, you know what I'm saying? They there. They there. And that's how we always been as a family. That's how we grew up as a family, supporting each other. And, man, I'm just I'm truly blessed to have them. Good. It's amazing that you guys have reached this level of success. In general, anybody that can make it this far deserves to get their flowers. Mm. When you make it this far, there's this misconception for celebrities and athletes that problems just magically go away. They don't exist anymore. <laughs> but everybody has to overcome adversity at some point. It didn't just stop once you made it to this point. Absolutely not. How have you navigated these struggles while maintaining to be a professional athlete? I think for me, it goes back to the same thing, man. Like, those values and morals that you come up with, you know what I'm saying? That's why it's important for parents to be there for their kids and be in their life and things like that because all those things I carry with me. Like, knowing when I was going through little problems as a kid back in the day that I thought was the end of the world, and my parents was there to... Hey, man, help me navigate through it. Help me navigate the emotions. Help me figure out what I can do. My older brothers are there to help me navigate it. So when things get bigger, you know, I get older, and now we got bigger problems coming. It's the same formula. You know what I'm saying? I still got the same support system. I still go to them with all my problems, and they help me walk through it. Like, I'm still their little brother, still their son. It's the it's the same thing. Like, And so to have that system in place so young and understanding where my support comes from, you know, when bigger problems come, I can go to the same support system, and they never fail me. Have you seen those external issues impact you on the court? If anything, I think they they probably have pushed me more. Like, basketball, that's, that's like therapy for me. That's that's my safe space. I just go out there, let everything out. So they impacted me in any way on the court. I would say it's always probably been positive because I get more energy to it. You know, I'm able to release and... You see me dunk on somebody, ah, you know, you letting it out. You know, they even right there. You see me talking trash to somebody, you letting it out. Like the court, like that was, that was one place I can always just go to let that out. Like, so I don't think it's ever really, I can't say it's ever really hindered me or nothing like that. You always hear about these mental tolls that athletes are taking on. Mm -hmm. And when somebody sits out because of a mental health issue or something, something like that, right? Mm -hmm. They get flack for it. They mm -hmm. get attacked for it. But nobody really knows what's happening with people. They yeah. just assume, once again, because I'm at this level, because I do this at a professional level and people know my name, I'm automatically supposed to have the perfect life. That's just not the case because it, it makes it can make it even tougher to deal with, you know what I'm saying, because you got such a high demand in life and you got to be in this city, this city, doing this, this, playing this game, this game. You don't even really got time to sit down and check on yourself sometimes, you know what I'm saying, so... That's something that I never understood why people think, you know, you got money or you live in this lifestyle. You just, all your problems just disappear. That, that doesn't even make sense. You know what I'm saying? We we all human. We all go through stuff, you know, whether you got million dollars in the bank account or got nothing in your bank account. We all go through different things and different problems. Like, that's, that's just how it go. So somebody sitting out for their mental health, like you said, you don't know what they're going through. Like, we sit out for physical injuries all the time. Like, you got to sit out, take care of your mind, get your mind straight. Nothing wrong with that. It's very important to do that. What do you feel like's the toughest thing you've had to overcome so far? Being away from my son. Like, I was going through a bunch of different things with that. And, you know, just being away from him for a while, you know, that that was killing me inside. And so, but, you know, we got that resolved and, you know what I'm saying, was able to come through that. And, um, but, yeah, that was... 
without a doubt, the toughest thing for me that I ever had to go through. And then mid-season trades, man. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> hey, man. <laughs> mid-season trades is another one. Talking about your son. Mm -hmm. You got to be away from him and you got to navigate going to a new city. Yeah. Something that's not even familiar for you. And it's something I never went through. You know what I'm saying? This is this is another new experience. So So when you were traded for cash, mm -hmm. that wasn't during the season? Nah, that was in the summer. I got traded in the summer. So I, I had time to, you know, kind of recalibrate everything, move everything. But, you know, mid season they wanted me to in D C the next day. So like it, it definitely comes with challenges, man. Like the main one, like you said, my son, he in school in Dallas, you know what I'm saying? So Trying to navigate that, making sure he can finish the school year there while I'm out taking care of business, you know, trying to see the, the, you know, kind of the best avenues to do things like that, you know. That's stuff people don't really think about, you know, it's real life, you know, got to pick up and move. But my son, he, he's a great dude, man. He, he, he rolls with the punches. He just loves life, love whatever comes with it. And, you know, he just, he loves being with his dad, so... No, he makes it easier. What kind of mental impact has that midseason change had on you, though? It's been a lot, you know, just learning different systems and going to a different team, different city. You know, mentally, it is definitely a lot. But I think the excitement that comes with it, you know, new situation, new opportunity, you know, um, it kind of mitigates it for me. You know, it's a lot, but at the same time, I'm playing basketball like, I get a chance to go to the gym every day to release these feelings and things, how that outlet. And, you know, it's all great for me. It, it, it's, it's a beautiful thing, you know, once you once you get through the first 24 hours of all the crazy feelings and not knowing what you're going to do about it. But it's a beautiful thing. Do you feel like relying on basketball as your emotional outlet has prevented you from being able to kind of talk about these things? I don't think so. Like, I, I really don't have a too much of an issue talking about things that I go through, but it's mostly with my family. Like, I'm very, very closed off in, you know, other situations I probably won't open up as much. But, you know, with my problems with my family, we talk about everything. So I, I'm able to talk with them pretty much through it. And basketball is kind of that physical outlet where I can kind of just let the rest out. I didn't really think you had a problem because you're so well-spoken. And I feel like being an athlete, you have to understand yourself to be able to perform at the highest level possible. I just felt like, shit, it's got to it's gotta be a question that's got to be asked. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, nah, no doubt. No doubt. Nah, it's, it's good questions, man. Like, this, this is one of the best interviews I did. I tell you, yeah, I'm comfortable here for sure. So that cash considerations, man... That dude, man, I hate that dude, man. I, I do not like that dude. How does that impact your perception of your value as a player? Man, pissed off. Pissed off. i never forget that, man. Just, like, because they telling me the trade is going to happen, so I'm like, okay, bet, new opportunity. Who I'm getting traded for? Like, oh, yeah, they just traded you for cash. For cash? Are you serious, bro? Like... I averaged this, that, that I did, this, that, that the last year. I, like, I just remember, like, my age, and I'm going off on my age, and he like, bro, wait a minute, this is good for you. Like, you in a better situation. Who cares? I'm like, nah, bro, I don't like the way that's attached to my name, bro. Y'all, they could at least got a player for me or somebody. And, man, I remember going into that year in Phoenix, and my brother actually tells me, like, this is, like, the angriest year of Duncan that he's seen. He was like, you was in Phoenix. You was just Duncan different. I'm like, man, it was probably just a little extra. I had some for cash considerations and his homies, man. I, I just getting traded for cash, man. I, that, that pisses me off every time I talk about it for real. Like, disrespectful. And again, that's one of those situations that nobody really knows unless, you know, you're talking to somebody that that situation's happened to. I can't speak for nobody else. It pissed me off, though. It, it pissed me off bad. <laughs> so you were in Sacramento when the Halliburton and Fox, like, that whole debate was oh, going yeah. on, right? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. What, what did that look like? What's funny is, from the outside, you know, everybody was pit, kind of pitting, like, uh, who's going to be better? Who's going to be better? Tyrese or Fox? And on the inside, them two dudes loved each other, bro. Like, they trying to see how can I defer to you? Like, right, I'm going to get you to rock here or I'm going to get you to rock here. They trying to figure out how they can make each other look better. So, like, like for them to be young stars like they are and to be that unselfish, man, I, I, I rock with Fox. I rock with Tyrese. Like, them, them, them two dudes are special, man, for sure. It's definitely a crazy situation. And it was a great situation because, I mean, you see where you 
where you guys went in the playoffs. Oh yeah, oh yeah. Now it was Sacramento. Like they they turned some things around. Like they they turned some things around. But they they fans out there. They always were supportive. Even when we was one of the worst teams in the league when I was there. Like the fans came and packed out the house every night. And so to see them turn it around, be in the playoffs and. Had that energy, man, it is dope. It is super dope to see that. All right, man. Well, we're going to close out right now. I got one last question for you. I actually kind of asked it earlier. You've mentioned that you got to keep working to prove your game. Mm -hmm. That's one of the most important things that you've talked about and you've shown it once again. From JUCO to the NBA, you've done it all. You've worked hard as a second-round pick. You've made it almost 10 years. You will make 10 years for sure. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. What do you feel like is the biggest change that you've seen in yourself, both as a person and as a professional, throughout these 10 years? Definitely just my approach and the respect I have for the game. Like, when the OGs used to say that when I first got into the NBA, I had no idea what they were talking about. But just what it is to be a professional, like, because before, you know, I used to run out there. My warm-up was just dunking. I used to eat whatever, you know what I'm saying? Like that, you, That's kind of how you come in because you don't have the knowledge and that respect. You haven't built that respect for the game. And now, you know, I my day start two hours before practice. I got to, you know, get massages. I got to warm up. I got to get my lift in. And I got to get my own court workout in. And then we practice. So just... Bring in a different level of respect, a different work ethic um, every single day, taking care of my body, um, just, you know, taking it serious what it means to be a professional basketball player, not just a basketball player, if that makes sense. Like, being a professional basketball player, playing basketball is just 25% of that. Like, it's business things you have to understand. It's, you got to understand your 401k plan. You got to understand... You know, what's coming in to your account? What taxes are being taken out? Who are you paying? Like, being a professional basketball player is so much more than just playing basketball. So I think just my approach to everything else that comes with being a professional outside of on the court, my approach to everything else has changed tremendously. Mm -hmm. And um, as a person, man, I honestly, I feel like I'm a lot more cutthroat. Like, I feel like... Before, you know, I would kind of let a lot of stuff rock. You know, I'm such a good guy. And, you know, you let stuff go. You know, people do things here. People do things. That, ah, it's okay. They didn't mean it. They, ah, it's okay. But I feel like, you know, being in this industry and seeing how things can go when you let stuff slide, you can be out of a job, out of an opportunity like that. Like, opportunity's gone just like that. So... As a person, like, I'm a lot more, you know, business-minded, a lot more cutthroat. Like, if something ain't aligned with my vision or something ain't aligned with where I'm trying to go, it's got to be removed. Don't mm -hmm. care what it is. Don't care who it is. Like, things have to align. And if the alignment's off, we moving on. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I think as a person, yeah, I'm definitely not the same in that regard. Mm -hmm. What's not meant for you is not meant for you. And if it is, then it'll stay in your life. Absolutely, 100%. And, and when stuff doesn't align with your purpose... You got to reevaluate where you're going and what you're doing and take those necessary measures, man. Absolutely. That's Absolutely. It. Yes, sir. Hey, man, I appreciate you sitting down with us. It was definitely a dope conversation. I'm sorry I fucked up so many times. You good, boss. <laughs> you good, man. I, I enjoyed it, man. I enjoyed it. This has definitely been one of my favorite interviews. Oh, so man, I appreciate course. you having me, man. Of course, man. The pleasure is mine. Real quick before we cut out, though. I need you to talk about what you guys got going on. You know, you guys are starting up this murder mystery dinner. Uh, what's the official name, Rich? Mystery Melodies. Talk about it real quick, man. Oh, man. So my, my brother and his wife came up with this incredible idea. And um, they are very, very, they, they, they love to try new things. Like, they always love to try new things. So they went on a date or something, I believe. I don't. You helped me with the story, brother. I don't know, but I believe it's a date to a murder mystery, murder mystery investigation type thing. And, you know, they saw it and they was like, yeah, it's pretty good, you know. But we feel like we can get more creative with it and add a little bit more sauce and flavor to it. So now we had a mystery melodies presented by Home Sweet Homes Management. 
and man, this is going to blow you away. I mean, it's an immersive experience. So you got to put something into it to get something out of it, which is my favorite part of it. And they add musical guests as well. So it's more so a little bit more sauce on it, but at the same time, it's a great storyline. Um, got a great cast of people coming in, and we're going to see if you can solve the mystery. So if you're into entertainment like that, into you know murder mysteries and things like that, and also want to have a little drink or something, come and vibe a little bit, Come slide on down, man. We got something for you. You got the answer to the mystery already? I'm going to tell you like this. I'm a detective. They call me Sherlock Holmes. That's what they call me. And um, that's the role I'm going to be playing. So we're going to see if I can find the answer. Hey, well, make sure you guys go ahead and check that out. You got a couple different ones coming up too, right? Uh, so not just today, but we got you. We'll, we'll throw out announcements for you. Uh, appreciate you again, bro. Make sure you guys go ahead, like, comment, and subscribe. Sad boys for real. Peace out. This is Sad Boy Radio.